Uh, this is Peyton. Peyton Jones will introduce himself, but this guy's been all over the place. How long were you, you were in uh, Wales for 10 years, right? 12 years. So he's, he's, he's a seasoned missionary, and I'm sure most of you guys know who he is. Um, so I'm not going to say a lot, but I'll let Peyton come up because I don't want to take his time. So anyway, welcome Peyton. Sick. How are you guys? Good to be here. Hey, Charlie. This is my church planting partner over there. Um, I want to introduce a couple people. Got uh, Pete Mitchell in the back there. Pete's uh, the co-host of the Church Planter podcast with me. Uh, we he's the publisher of Church Planter magazine. It's a magazine I edit. If uh, you ever want some encouragement leading up to mission. Church planning is all frontline stuff. And uh, Charlie and I got some hair-raising stories from Refuge Long Beach. If you've not heard stories from Refuge Long Beach, uh, you should come down and check it out. Uh, when we first planted, I told the, the team that uh, some of you read the book of Acts, um, and that's great, and that's enough for you. And others of you want to live the book of Acts. And I can promise you if you stay with us church planning on the front lines in the inner city of Long Beach, you will see things that you read about in the book of Acts. And you wondered, why does that stuff not happen today? Um, you will see uh, demonic possessions. Am I right? <laughs> you will see miracles. You will see miraculous conversions. You will see people crying out in the middle of a service saying, what does this mean for me? How can I be saved? We had a lesbian do that on our very first day uh, in the heart of the Rainbow District in Long Beach. Um, it's powerful stuff, so being on the front lines is a big deal. Um, I'm going to um, probably, um, you know, just start out by saying it's, it's an honor to be here. I'm a preacher. I'm not really much of a talker. I like to preach, so at one point, you know, I'm always out of my skin when I'm in this kind of scenario because I, like uh, I like to preach, and I like to use a text, and I like to get all animated and can't help it. You know, once you start getting in the Word, you get all excited, and, uh, you know, some of you guys like that. You're into that sort of thing. Um, but it's an honor to be here. You guys are missionaries, and uh, missionaries, as Jabba the Hutt said in Return of the Jedi... This bounty hunter is my kind of scum. And if you're here tonight and you're into missions, you're my kind of scum, right? You're a special type of person. You are the kind of people that I love to charge into battle. I, I tell church planting core teams. I met with a church planting core team today about a church plant in Stanton. Anybody really excited to go plant a church in Stanton? I didn't think so. Um, nobody wants to go plant in church uh, in, in Stanton. Nobody wants to go into the inner city. Uh, nobody wants to go plant in San Pedro because it's a rough place. And so afterwards tonight, we will have a practical uh, exercise where some people are going to come and we're going to talk. You're more than welcome to join us. You don't have to. Like, I'll actually let you go. Uh, but if you want to stay on and see what it looks like when a core team is forming for a church plant, we are planting in San Pedro. And so what I do... Uh, let me give you a little bit of history. Um, I started off uh, in ministry by accident. When I got saved, I started preaching the gospel to all my friends. First guy I preached to uh, was my best friend I grew up with. And uh, I was told I had to share my faith. So I called him up on the phone and said, hey man, can I come over to your house? He said, sure. I went over there and I shared the gospel with him. I only knew about five minutes worth of how to tell him, you know, God loves you. Jesus died for your sin. You're a dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking sinner, and you need him. And then I go, do you want to become a Christian? And he goes, okay. And I was like, this is great. We'll see what the big deal is. This is awesome. And I just kept sharing the gospel with everybody that I could. And then people started spitting on me and making fun of me. And I was like, okay, this is a little bit different. But I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, some of you don't know what that is. Uh, refer to Acts chapter 1. 
Um, if you remember, Jesus said, I want you to go out into all the world. That's a tall order, right? Um, they were scared. How many of you guys are scared getting ready to go on your mission trip? Anybody scared? Yes. Good. Now there's hope for you. Because that means that you're already beginning to sense, I cannot do this. You see, the guy that goes in, and, and we have this saying in church planning, I train church planners, but the first thing we say, if you ever come to a new breed church planning conference, first thing I say is there's no experts in this game. Because every time you plan a church, it's absolutely different. Every time you go on a missions trip, it's absolutely different. When I went into ministry, um, I was 19 years old. My youth pastor, his wife had schizophrenia. Now, we're, we're back in the, in the early 90s, okay? I'm 19 years old. It's around 1992. The pastor that was here at the time calls me up and says, hey, you want to take the youth group for a few months? Youth pastor's wife is sick, and we're asking him to take some time off. And I said, okay, you know, whatever. I'm in college. I'm in nursing school. Uh, I'll do it. And uh, ended up becoming the youth pastor. She took 16 years to get well. And she did actually receive a healing um, for schizophrenia. She's, you wouldn't even know. I'm a psych nurse. I've finished school. I, I can... I can if you have a mental illness, I can spot you a mile away. All you have to do is start talking to me, and I can tell what you're like at baseline just from experience. So don't be scared, but, uh, <laughs> but, but psychiatric, you know. If you're messed up with emotional problems, well, that's just everybody, right? We're all broken by the fall. But I mean psychiatric, so uh, I couldn't even tell. But anyways, so it, it, it was kind of coming into ministry through the back door, right? I was always a guy that never saw myself getting into ministry, um, always felt out of my depth. I'd be 19, 20 years old, people calling the church, you know, my marriage is breaking up. And I'd be like, ah, you know, like, I'm not even married. I'm 20, you know, I'm still in college. And I wouldn't know what to do. And I'd feel like such a failure. And I remember this one family that the, the, the guy calls up and goes, let me tell you about my wife who goes to your church. And he was a big construction worker. And I knew who he was, but he wasn't saved. And uh, I can remember he... Um, you know, I tried talking to him. Well, you know, I, I don't know what she did. Yeah, man, she contacted her old high school boyfriend, and they've gone out to dinner a couple of times. I don't know what else has gone on. She's probably cheated on me, and I'm divorcing her, and I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and I tried talking to him, and he was just yelling and getting more angry. And I remember putting the phone down. I just get on my knees, like, <laughs> out of my depth. I don't know what to do. You know, it's like, I don't. I can't do this. And I prayed. And about an hour goes by, and she calls me up, and she's hysterical, and she's saying, uh, what'd you say to my husband? She's crying. I can barely understand her. I said, nothing. I, I, I failed on the phone. I, I didn't, didn't, didn't say anything. And she's freaking out, saying, well, you know, he's, he's saved. You know? And, uh, turns out the end of the story was when we got off the phone and I prayed and it wasn't my prayers. My prayers aren't magic. I'm not a very good prayer anyways, but he went up on the, the parking structure of his building and I don't know if he was thinking of jumping. That would make a better story, but all I know is he was really angry. He was looking out over top and the power of God, the Spirit of God just fell on him. Convicted him of his sin. Brought him to his knees. He gave his heart to Christ. I mean, these are just stories. Like I could tell you story after story, after story. And I mean, I could tell you a story. I can tell you crazy stories, right? Um, I, some of my guys are here. They remember some of the, some of the stories I've told. Um, I remember once this woman was trying to get uh, this family um, to listen to one of the teenage girls that had gotten saved on her youth camp, had uh, gotten pregnant. And uh, it happens, right? Maybe you don't think she's a Christian because you got pregnant. Boy, are you in for a surprise about what a Christian is. I've been in ministry 20-something years. Nothing shocks me. Here's the deal. She ends up, uh, this, this friend, this high school girl's friend's mom comes over and tries talking to the parents. They're like, get out of here. We're calling the cops. We're taking her to get the abortion. And so she's out on the street corner, and she's like, you know, 
if only God, if only I had a, a megaphone, you know, I could yell encouragement to her in her room. And some crazy guy from Beach Boulevard and Enger is out there preaching, yelling at cars, and he goes, bing! <laughs> and he starts, whoa. And he starts, like, walking over. He literally, he comes uh, all the way through the neighborhood. It was over off of uh, Amazon. If you go in this neighborhood here, down share through Amazon, there's a, a wall there that you have, there, and then there's a cul-de-sac. He hops it. She's literally, like, 15 minutes there, and she's hyster- She's called me, and I'm like at the church, and I'm doing stuff, and I'm saying, give me a little bit of time, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she, you know, sees this guy hop over the wall with a megaphone. He's like, what's going on? And she's like, she like freaks out. You have a megaphone. Oh, by the way, if you don't know who I'm talking about, Chad Williams, Navy SEAL. Um, his mom. Oh, that's how I should reference it. So this is a real person, right? Chad Williams is in my youth group before he's a Navy SEAL. So this is Gina Williams, Chad Williams' mom, okay, back when they went to this church years and years ago. So she goes, oh, megaphone. And so when I show up, that dude, as soon as she uses the megaphone and yells all the encouragement and scriptures to the teenage girl inside who doesn't want to have abortion, wants to follow the Lord, the guy goes, I have to go. And he grabs his megaphone and hops over the wall. Guys, we are dealing with a supernatural God, okay? When you are on frontline mission, God has a way of turning up. Now, you'll notice I don't have any tattoos because I'm addicted to something else right now. If I did have tattoos, it would be all the different churches that have been a part of planting over the years. That's what I would get tattooed with. Because more addicting than anything else I can possibly think of is being a part of a startup work when the Holy Spirit turns up in a community, there's no Christians, all the chips are down, and it's like God has to turn up. And that's where I was for 12 years in Wales. I was always out of my depth. God always had to turn up at the 11th hour and do something I didn't expect. And I never became an expert. So if this is your first missionary experience, guess what? You are in for an incredible adventure. And I got good news for you. God has a way of bypassing the experts and picking guys like Gideon who are scared. Picking boys like David to run at giants. Right? Picking Timothys who have to be told we... (laughs) It'll come to me. <laughs> Sounded so good, I was like setting it up. <laughs> it, it came to me, thank you. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. You love people? Boom. Got the Holy Spirit in you. Even if you don't love people, let the Holy Spirit love people through you. Do any of you, I tell my guys all the time, anyone here hate people? Anyone hate people? You're not going to be honest, are you? You're like, oh, I love people. You liars. You hate people. I've been out there on the road with you. It's true, isn't it? We all want to pretend, oh, I love people because I'm a Christian. Paul said the only good thing in me, there's no good thing dwells in my flesh. Love? If I could love God with all my heart and love my neighbor as myself, I'd be perfect. I would have kept the whole law. That's the sum of the law. You all suck at that. Let's be honest. But Paul says the love of Christ compels us. As if God were in us pleading, like Mike Bonomo said, instant people person, just add the Holy Spirit. That's what you need. See, the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. You are out of your depth. So I want you to turn with that in mind to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and that's where we're going to kick off Acts chapter 1. And we're talking about teams, mission teams, mission support teams. Jesus handpicked and hand-trained his mission team for three years. You could not picture a more prepared team A better equipped team. I mean, they had already seen the dead raised. They had cast out demons. They had done all kinds of cool stuff that you've only read about. And Jesus tells them, go out into all the world, preaching the gospel. And then in Acts chapter 1, he tells them, go 
But wait. You're not ready. You need something. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Somebody read that out loud for me. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Okay. You shall receive what? Power. Power. I want you to remember that the entire time that you were on the mission field. I want you to be asking like Gideon, where is this God that our fathers told us about? You're studying missionaries like E. Stanley Jones, Amy Carmichael, J. Hudson Taylor. These were people that put themselves on the front line of mission and they desperately needed God to turn up in years where you sent your possessions over in a pine box. Because most likely that was how you were coming home. These people needed God. They were pioneers of mission. And the stories that we read about, we read about not because of who they were, but because of who God was and because of who God still is. And the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever will continue to be that God in a few months when you go out there. You see, we have tamed Christianity in the West. Let me just say to you, if any of you have kids that don't go to church anymore, I'm going to tell you why. Because Christianity doesn't make sense if you're not on mission. It doesn't make sense apart from mission. We turn Christianity into a gathering, almost like a religious country club. Now, this church is a mission-sending church. That's why you're here. This is an awesome turnout for a church of this size. Right? You know, January, this is all about missions. Pastor Bill, when he came here, said, I am not going to pastor you. I am going to equip you as missionaries. I'm going to fulfill Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to equip you to go out and change the world. And Pastor Bill loved nothing more than to get all of your butts out of these pews and get them out in the mission field. Correct? That's the sense you get. He loves you, but he wants to see you leave. Not because you're mad to go to another church, but because you're so filled with the love and joy of the Lord that you need to go out where man has never gone and boldly go there, like James T. Kirk, not for the Starship Enterprise, but for Jesus, and go out there and share the gospel. Here's the deal. He starts off and he says, starting with Jerusalem, you'll receive power from on high, and starting in Jerusalem, that was Pentecost, boom! Suddenly 3,000 men, not counting women and children, saved. Then it spreads out to Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. Okay? So wherever you start, that's where you need. So the first question is, are you on mission? See, like I said, Christianity doesn't make sense apart from mission. Um, Jesus tells them to go. He tells them to wait, but he tells them to go. Right? We all want what happens in Acts chapter 2. We want to go. We don't want to do it. He says to do in Acts chapter 1, seek me, wait on me, get close to me, pray, seek power from on high. You're not ready. You're not equipped. That's what they learned those few days. And then when the power came, it wasn't that they learned. It was everyone around them learned, whoa, what's going on here, right? Because you can attract a crowd, right? It's not hard to attract a crowd. There's lots of uh, seminars and stuff that teach pastors how to attract crowds and all that kind of stuff. And you got to send this kind of flyer out to the community and you got to do this and you got to have that. And then you got to get bicycles away when they come. And then you got to, that's when man attracts a crowd and that's cool. If that's how you get him in to hear the gospel, that's cool. But Acts chapter one and two is about how God attracts a crowd. How God attracts a crowd is he does something to you that is so radical and so different that when you go out there, there is a pulling power. Just like when people follow Jesus, and Isaiah pro prophesies about him and says, there was nothing comely or attractive. There was no way, reason that we should have been drawn to him. But what was it? He was baptized with the Holy Spirit from day one. And that's what makes a difference. What infuriates me and frustrates me is it's like we're, we're, we're sometimes we lose sight of the most basic tenets of the Scripture is God delights in using ordinary people. Because he is an extraordinary God. It's not the vessel, 
It's what's filling the vessel, right? When you go out and you get a really cool beverage, you don't go, whoa, this glass must be really special because this stuff tastes awesome. You go, man, what is this in here? What is this inside of here? This is awesome. You don't even think about the container, amen? You don't even think about it. Whenever you drink a beverage, you never even... Oh, look at the fine craftsmanship on that mug. Look at that. Will you do? Look at that. You're so into what you're drinking, that's what you're focused on. That's what we're talking about. So when you go out into the world, there's this power that you are taking with you. You're being sent out in power. So I'm going to move on because I'm supposed to talk about teams. I'm getting on my hobby horses there. But I believe that the church right now is suffering from not knowing what it's supposed to do. Are we supposed to gather? No. We're supposed to go to places where they don't gather. Make sense? You see, youth, if you got them busy, here's a, when I was a youth pastor, if you get them busy on mission, suddenly Christianity clicks. I remember when I was a youth pastor, right? And we would have these trips, and we would take like eight people. I'm, I'm just here to tell you, you're going to be changed when you go on this trip. It changes you. It opens, suddenly Christianity makes sense. Because a lot of people were sitting in church bored. This is boring. La, 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 I sing my song, and then I listen to a sermon, and then whatever afterwards, you know, um, small talk and co coffee and donuts and cool. And I'm bored. Is that all there is? Is that it? Really? I mean... You know, the Bible talks about you have spiritual gifts. I bet you didn't even know you have them, right? Some people don't even know what their gifts are because they're never called on to use them. See, when you get out on the mission field, you start discovering your gifts because you're on mission. But you don't have to go on the mission field. This is why church planning for me is awesome. It's for me, I come here and I tell Christians, hey, you ready to go on an adventure? You ready to go church plant? Because your, your gifts are needed. In a church plant, boom, you're going to plant a church. Suddenly, it's all hands on deck, baby. This ain't a cruise ship. <laughs> this is like an old Spanish galleon, man. It's got oars in the water, you know. We need you. You're back at the oars. You know, mush. We're not cracking the whip on you, but you're using your muscles. You're, you know, you're not like sitting in a deck chair sipping a pina colada. You're, 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 you're out there to, you know, liberate some slave ships. That takes some work. We got to overpower some some ships. We've got to outrun some, 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 some vessels. So a lot of people are suffering from not knowing what to do. And I think a lot of Christians are bored. And I think a lot of youth think, man, this doesn't make any sense. So here, here's what I'm saying. Um, when I used to take these kids on an airplane, they go overseas. And before that, I was your youth pastor. And they'd all sit in front of me like this. And I'd be like, read your Bible. They'd be like, yeah, no, I suck. And then I'd be like, yeah, you know, share with your friends. Oh, I'm trying to, but I get scared. Pray, you know, blah, 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 blah. Then we take them out on the mission field, okay? When we took them out on the mission field, something changed. Suddenly, it was like they would go out and they would very, you know, they would be scared and they'd go out and they'd start sharing the gospel and the power would come. I remember walking down the train and when we were in Hungary Walking down the train car, you know, car after car, and watching my kids sitting with strangers in all these different train cars, and looking in, I remember this one car, and I'll never forget it. It was a young girl. She must have been 16, 17 years old, and she's in there with an entire family. The whole family's weeping. The translator's weeping. She's weeping. She's 16 years old. She's leading an entire family to Christ. How do you not come away from that, a changed person? Recently, um, when we launched Long Beach, we did Open Air Church, and it was radical. And I can remember we came up on Matthew 10, where uh, Matthew 10 was all about, um, you know, sending out the 72. And uh, Jesus just, they show up one morning. Like, imagine you showed up tonight, and I'm like, okay, everyone, five minutes, blah, 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 and then I go, right, Bella Terra, boom. And you'd be like, no. No, oh, we came for teaching. That's what Jesus did to them. They showed up. Okay, Lord, cook us up some, you know, hot, tasty teaching this morning. And he goes, goodbye. And they just went. And I remember I told everyone, you know, it was a week after Thanksgiving, bring your Thanksgiving sandwiches. You know, we're going to, uh, 
uh, feed the homeless after church, so be ready for that. You know, what I didn't tell them was church is going to last 10 minutes. And normally our church goes two hours. That's a whole other story. But uh, the only people that want church, by the way, to, to last an hour are Christians because they've been conditioned to think that. Non-believers are like, man, this is awesome. You know, no, let's not stop now. People are answering my questions finally. So we have discussion. It's a big story. I might get into it. But here's the deal. So we opened the Bible, went into Matthew 10, and I said, right, guys, the lesson this morning, after I talk about it for five minutes, go into the park. I'll see you in 45 minutes to an hour. And they all went. And I go, that's the look right there. That's the exact same look the disciples were giving Jesus. That's what you need. You see, the missing ingredient that holds everything else together, the nucleus, is mission. Because God is a missional God. God is on mission. God is there before you. You know how Jesus says, when you get there, right? He tells him in Matthew 10, when you go there, find the person of peace. You know what that's implying? That's saying that there's a person God has already reached before you. Find that person and connect with them. God has already been on mission there. You're just heading in finally to the slipstream. You're going where God already is. You see, when I went as a missionary, I remember going to the second town that I ministered in, and they, uh, I went to this one lady's house. Her husband was all uh, stoned, and she was drunk, and they came over for a barbecue and caused a big scene and got in a big fight and stumbled home. And my wife and I are like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> that, that's crazy. And, and, and then a couple days later, we went to go call on him, and I walked into her house, and the Holy Spirit was just filling the room. I remember going, I was kind of offended. I was like a young missionary, and I'm like, hey, I bring this. What's the big idea? Me, missionary, me bring spirit of God. I was kind of ticked off that, like, I wasn't needed, you know? I was like, God came here first, and he was already there, and God started taking apart everything that I thought. We started a few years later, we started a church in a Starbucks, and I'd already, I was mad at God. I had quit ministry. I'm done. I quit. I hate Christians, you know, on and on. And, you know, I don't care if you guys judge me. You, you, you know, you, you haven't been through what I've been through. So, you know, you haven't been a pastor. If you were a pastor, you'd understand, right? If I, I determine if I ever teach at a pastor's conference, I'm going to teach that one verse or Moses in the Old Testament goes, God, why do you hate me that you have put me with these people? Remember when he says that to God? And then he goes, kill me now. That's the perfect text. Every pastor knows. Oh, man, thank you. That ministered to me so much. <laughs> but, uh, but I was so mad because I was tired of, like, fighting through Christians, all traditional church here and stuff. And anyways, I go into Starbucks, and the Spirit just turns up. He was already there. 30 non-believers. We start a church. Long story, not going there. But here's the deal. Christ sets the trajectory in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, look, when the Spirit comes, He's going to do something to you. He's going to propel you outwards. The trajectory is always out. Right? Go out. So mission is a thing. Most people are just like, like Francis Chan says, right? They're like, Lord, it says go in here, but... You know, uh, we're, 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 we're going to study that a little bit more. And he says, what would it be like if like, my, I told my daughter to clean her room? I said, go clean your room. And they go, you know, come back in a little while. Did you clean your room? No, Dad, but I thought about it a little bit, you know. Thought about it. Thought about what you meant when you said that. And in fact, Dad, what's going to happen is we're going to have some of my friends come over. And um, we're going to talk about what it actually means in the Greek to clean your room. And then we're going to have a little discussion group and a Bible study that meets every week that talks about what it looks like uh, if we actually did go. And then we're going to apply it to our lives. I said earlier that Christianity doesn't make sense without mission because the Spirit was given and promised for mission. If you understand anything about Acts chapter 1, the Spirit was promised for mission. Remember the Great Commission? At the end of Matthew, what does he say? Go into all the world, and I will be with you. The connection of the presence of God, the power of God, is always in connection to mission. So I served with a, a Pentecostal guy, um, one of the church plants. Uh, he, he used to always say, why are you asking for the Holy Spirit if you're not going to do anything? God doesn't give you more of the Holy Spirit if you're not going to go. Why would he? 
You could just like hang out and no, he gives it in connection. That's where power comes from. So you step out in faith and boom, that's where the promise comes in for power. Amen? Amen. Some of you guys are going to be in situations where things just happen because you went. Gifts suddenly, oh, I didn't know I could prophesy. When I, I don't have a raging gift of prophecy. But if I'm talking to unsaved people, particularly really belligerent ones, there was one case of a <laughs> demon-possessed one in Refuge Long Beach. Um, that's where it busts out. You know? A prophecy. Boom. And some of you guys are like, oh my gosh, that's weird. That's like Bible stuff. We don't do that anymore. You will on the front lines. Because that's where it's needed. You need it. Recently I went to a, a conference. It's kind of, I doubt any of you would go there because you're here. Uh, but it's kind of famous. <laughs> it's different types of Christians, you know what I'm saying? There's like Christians are into one thing, Christians are into another. Um, this conference, like I went there, it's like the big, you know, hotness. And you go there and it's like all the big speakers and the guy from Chick-fil-A and, you know, all the, you know, the big guys and all the hardest rock and worship bands and all the, you know, everyone's wearing skinny jeans and lumberjack shirts and big beards and black horn rim glasses. And they're like, yeah, man, it's going to be different. And uh, so... I, I go to this thing, and, and, and I, I watch. I'm just looking around. I'm like in culture shock because I've been a missionary for like 12 years, and I'm going, man, this is crazy because, like, everybody's just, it's like Christian Disneyland. Like, guys are over there doing, like, Jesus paintball art. And they're, like, painting, like, something, and at the end someone's going to make a picture out of it, how God spoke to them, and it's weird. And everyone takes turns, and then there were a bunch of people in the ball pits, like adults like swimming in ball pits and then there were like trampolines and ferris wheels and christians going Wee! you know on these ferris wheels and i just i remember walking around going this is weird this is supposed to be like the next generation like you know look out world here they come they're riding ferris wheels and shooting paintball you know well, look out world you know and I'm, I'm just thinking like man like I don't get it, you know? And, and, and I remember walking around going, that's because they've substituted fun for adventure. They substituted fun. You see, Christianity is meant to be an adventure. A little bit of danger. A little bit of you don't know what's going to happen. A little bit of the unexpected. A little bit of out of your depth. And none of us really like that, but it's out of our comfort zone. A little bit of risk. A little bit of fear. A lot of faith. And boom, that's when the Holy Spirit meets you. That's when the Holy Spirit turns up. And that is the adventure that Jesus promised if you'd go on mission with him. Him promised he was going to be fun. Fun and adventure are two different things. I remember being in New Zealand once, and they told us, we said, where's the place where all the kids go? And they go, well, it's over in the center of town. This is in Auckland. So we, we, we walked in. We were part of the like, frontline team for Calvary Chapel, Auckland. There wasn't a Calvary Chapel there yet. So we're like, you know, walking, and it takes us an hour and a half. <laughs> like an hour was bad, and a half. And I've got teenagers with me, and they're crying, and they're all upset, and I'm grumpy. You know, I'm really angry too. Like, man, they said it was going to be, and, 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 and I'm getting grumpy, and I'm trying to hold it together because they're all crying and upset. And we get there, and like, they told us there's going to be hundreds of kids there. And we had like this skit we were going to do, and we had, you know, we we're going to preach a bit, and we we're going to have all, had all these tracks we lugged with us and backpacks, which made it for a heavy walk. We got to this uh, square. They, um, there was no one there. I was mad. I was so mad. You know how like you read about Jonah? He's like, repent. And he walks, you know, he goes away just quick so he goes and repent you know he's not really into it so I was I look and I see two kids skateboarding I'm like here's a track here's a track then I walk across the square and I see this guy leaning up against a, a little ledge and um, he obviously looks like he's kind of homeless and stinky and so I just said you know here's a track and I walk back to my group and they're like aren't we gonna do the skit I'm like if you want to so I turn back around and I'm like to two kids and the guy, I'm like, do you guys want to see like this Jesus play thing we're going to do? I was just, I had had enough. And they're like, the two kids are like, mm-hmm. And then this like kind of homeless looking dude goes, okay. 
and we did it. Sin box, you don't remember the sin box? You guys ever seen that? Sin box? Um, and, and so we do the sin box, and it's about this person stuck in a sin box, and they can't get out, and they can't get themselves out, and they need Jesus to get them out. So we did this skit, and I'm mad the whole time, right? Tired. My feet hurt. And I just remember at the end, I, I look up, and this dude's like weeping. And I'm like, whoa, you know, nothing to do with me. And uh, he got saved that night. We, afterwards, you know, you can save right there. Save me. He, you know, we talked to him and told him a little bit about what it was about. And we said, hey, man, we're, we're super hungry. We're going to dinner. You want to get some pizza with us? Yeah. And he was stinky. He did stink. We found out. He, was, he lived in a shed um, behind someone. Someone had this shed, and they let him live there. And um, he said, you know, all I have is the clothes on my back. I have cigarettes. Um, and, and I got these matches, and he goes, and in the shed is gasoline, and tonight I was going to pour it all over myself and burn myself after I got really drunk. Within six months, that dude was a deacon. And the next year, he was on leadership there. You just never know what the Lord's going to do. That's a supernatural God who will go before you and who will go with you. And I'm telling you these stories because I want you to understand, like Paul says, treasure in jars of clay. It's a spirit in you. It's nothing else. So when we come tonight and we talk about teams, I just want to um, kind of encourage you that, that no one person is going to be all that. Okay? So when you're going, you're, you're going to, they're not all that, and you're not going to be all that. Okay? Uh, I serve, by the way, I, I take Ephesians 4 literally. So when I plan a church, I'm not like the dude, right? I serve with a team. I, I believe that there's a mix of teams in the New Testament. There's guys who are shepherds. There's guys who's teachers. There's guys who's evangelists. There's guys who are more prophetic. They walk in the supernatural. If you're uncomfortable with that thing, you're in the wrong church because Calvary Chapel believes in that. You can go on calvarychapel.com right now and read a, an argument about that in response to Strange Fire. And then I believe, which is, oh, I'm going to plug my book. Shameless plug. Um, church Zero. You can go to churchzero.com and download the first chapter, by the way. Cha-ching! There it is. Hold it up. High and proud, Dan. Church Zero. That's what it looks like. Church is her. I didn't design the cover. It's uh, Church Zero. You grab it at Barnes & Noble. It's a real book. You know, it actually was published by a real publisher, David C. Cook. Um, you can grab it online. You can go to churchzero.com, and it's all about what I just said about Ephesians 4 and going on mission and blah, 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 blah. But here's the deal. Um, in that book, I talk about the fact that, and this is going to sound crazy to you, but please understand me, that there are guys like me who are church planners, right? I'm a serial church planner. If I strike once, I'm going to strike again. I like to call myself a church planning ninja because it just sounds cool. But I don't stay in one place. So some of you guys would have heard about Refuge Long Beach. Charlie and I planted that together. Those ugly people with us in the back, they were with us, um, except for Melissa. She's not ugly. But the rest of us, eh. So we all planted. Now Charlie uh, has gone on to plant Whittier, Impact Whittier. So um, what we do, and, and tonight we're having a group about, you know, Ruben there. We're going to talk about him leading a team into San Pedro. So that's what we're always doing. I, people always used to ask, what do you do? And I say, I used to give this big, long explanation. I finally learned to say, you know what Paul does in the New Testament? That's what I do. I preach the gospel in hard to reach places. I raise up leadership. And then I get the heck out of Dodge. And it's weird that that's strange today when that's what the apostles did. And so when you see the word apostle in the New Testament, um, it doesn't always mean like, you know, the 12. The 12 were special, right? They had superpowers and they wrote the Bible and all that stuff. But then there's guys that are just church planners. They're guys on the move. They move around. And so that was kind of, I came to understand because I would plant something and then I'd get bored. And I'd be like, why am I bored? What's wrong with me? What's broken? And I realized that I really needed to go plant again. And so I realized that I'm not a pastor. I'm not the guy who stays in one spot. 
I am a church planter. And it, that's the word apostolos for missionary, right? Timothy's called that, by the way, so don't limit it to the 12. Titus is called apostolos. Apollos is called apostolos. That same word's used, but they're not the 12. The 12 were special, right? We all got that. No one's wearing pope hats. Got me? No superpowers here, folks. Just church planner. And so some of you guys are going to go out on this mission field and you're going to discover, wow, you know what? I have gifts that I've never used because I've never been called upon to use them. No one's ever asked me what my gifts are. No one's given me opportunity to use my gifts. What I've used is my butt, <laughs> my ears, because that's how we set it up. Make sense? When you go on mission, you're going to use your hands. You're going to use your heart. You're going to use your mouth. You're going to use spiritual gifts. Things are going to be coming out of you that you never knew were there. And so one of the things you're going to need is a home team. Okay, I'm not talking about playing away games or home games, but that could apply. Here's the deal. You're going to have people who need to stay behind. Great pioneer missionary C.T. Studd said this, I will go down into the deepest, darkest hole if you'll hold the rope. Uh, he went to Africa, and he started a, a big network, a big movement of uh, Bushmen. They went out church planting. Pretty amazing. You can read his book. It's by Norman Grubb. It's called C.T. Stud. Uh, I think it's called Pioneer Cricketeer or something like that, um, but a great book. Just look up C.T. Stud. Um, worth checking him out. He said, uh, some love to live within the sound of church and steeple bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. What a philosophy, huh? And he had been almost like a star athlete, almost kind of like, who would it be today? Peyton Manning? Everybody knew his name. Household, even if you didn't follow the sport, you knew who C.T. Studd was. And he started with a bunch of young guys, uh, a group called the Cambridge Seven, um, absolutely spawned a whole wave of missionaries. Some of you guys know Keith Green. Anybody here know Keith Green? Keith Green started a whole wave of missionaries uh, towards the end of his ministry, and when he died, it really nailed, uh, you know, kind of his point home, and everybody head out. Mission boards reported they had never seen anything like that. Well, there's always prep work that needs to go. In fact, the Apostle Paul, but before you can go to the mission field, you have to have people holding the rope for you, and that's your support team. So when I went on the mission field 15 years ago, I was there for 12 years. The only reason I had staying power was because I had people dedicated to keeping me over there. People that were holding the rope from this end. Now, I always had to work with my hands to a certain degree, but what jobs I had to take was largely dependent upon how much money was coming in. Right now, tonight, I got a, 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 an email from a church planner, uh, one of my church planners up in Washington, and he asked me this, and it broke my heart, because these guys are giving everything to go to hard communities for the gospel, places that are in some ways dangerous. This guy's up in the hood in Seattle. And he wrote me tonight and said, look, is it okay if I don't send you my newsletter because I'm running out of stamps, man? Did you understand what he meant by that? I remember coming back uh, from the mission field my first two years and people were like, what have you done? Gosh, you're so thin. You know, what, what's your diet secret? And I tell them I don't eat. And they'd be like, ha, 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 ha. And I'd be like, no, really, I don't eat. <laughs> I lived for a year and a half on toast, eggs, and beans. And I prepped. I had full support when I left, but God had a little surprise up his sleeve for me. It was called 9-11, where... All United States charities reported that there was an average of 50% decline in their giving after 9-11 because everybody's securities, you know, were in danger. So they pulled everything back. But I went to work in a factory and that was great. And I learned that probably the place where I belong is out amongst people more than anywhere else. That's where I started discovering my gifts. It's really strange how sometimes you're in ministry and you do so little ministry when you're in ministry. You see, you will touch more people by Monday morning, 12 o'clock noon, lunchtime, than most pastors will in an entire week. 
Do you understand that? You are already on mission. You just maybe haven't realized it. When you start setting up a mission team, all, all that is, and maybe you're going to be people that start a mission team. Maybe you'll be the people that you go on the short-term mission, you get a taste for it, and then you say, you know what, I'm not going to go overseas, but I still want to be on mission. So I got a fire lit in me. I don't want it to die. Oh, look, the Keenans. Or, oh, look, you know, boom, boom, boom. I remember sitting in a bar with Bob Keenan before he got saved. Don't be shocked. I was doing a wedding. And uh, he said to me, Peyton, will you go down to the bar with me? I said, sure. I didn't drink, so I had a Coke. I shared the gospel with him. He didn't get saved then. I can't take credit for Bob. Hey, everyone, I led Bob Keenan to Christ. I, I can't do that. But the reality is, Bob Keenan needs a support team. He needs someone to hold the rope. He needs finances. If you see your missionaries coming back really skinny, <laughs> you should probably go join their mission team. You know what I'm saying? Paul writes in a few different places in the scripture, he writes to the Romans that he would like them to help provide for his needs. And Roman, you can read it in Romans chapter 15. You can read about it in Philippians 4, where he writes to the Philippians and he says, hey, I helped plant that church. Will you help propel me the rest of the way? And one of the things that, that missionaries really need is PR agents. So I, the, the people that always come to mind in this church is uh, Debbie and Howard Oaks, right? Like, who do they represent? Does anyone know? Anyone know? You always see them wearing the clothes when they dress up like Alibaba? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It might, man. I don't know. I don't go here anymore. But they represent the Kenans. I know that just from, you know, come shame on you. What do you guys do? Like blow out of here during the last worship song or something? You guys aren't real missionaries. But you need PR agents. You need people that are going to go, dude, you know what? I've been praying this newsletter, blah, blah, blah. Man, you got to read this thing. Pray for these guys. You need PR people, Right? So when Bill's up here, what's he doing? He's going, hey, I want you to hear these guys from the underground church in China. I want you to hear, Bill's a PR agent, right? But you guys can be PR agents. You can be like out to dinner with your friends and say, you know what, let me tell you about this incredible guy. Let me tell you about this incredible missionary. You can start raising. So that's part of what a support team does. You, you join the rummage sale that's going to be on uh, tomorrow. You join. You, you actually get your hands dirty. You, you bake cookies. You do fundraisers. You do all that crazy stuff. You go visit them. You give them magazine subscriptions, all right? Newspaper subscriptions. You can get things like the week in different countries. You can hear what's going on in different parts of the world. Um, so that's important. So let's talk before we close here. Um, one of the key things that they asked me to address tonight was communication. Because communication on a mission team, those of you that are actually going and not staying, uh, those of you that are going on the mission team, uh, you know communication breaks down. How many of you guys have perfect communication in your home? Anybody? Perfect communication with your kids? Perfect communication with your boss? Perfect communication with your coworkers? I'm kind of worried about you guys. How are you guys going to preach the gospel to people? I'm not very good at this. Um, and of course, I'm teasing. Because communication is just one of those things, isn't it? Here's the deal. Um, on your communication uh, with your team, there's a couple things that you need to do uh, on a regular basis. You need to talk. You need to have a time to debrief almost everything in your day. You start off in the morning, you lay out the schedule. This is what we're going to do today. The worst mission teams ever is where everyone gets up and they go, come on guys, we've got to leave at 8. Where are we going? We're going to a school. Right. Okay, so everyone's in a rush because no one's been communicated to. Then they head down to the school. Then they do whatever they're doing. They do the little play or whatever. Then it's like, where are we in lunch? Uh, uh, you're on need to know basis. Boom, boom, boom. And then they tell them. The best mission teams is when everything's known in advance. Now, everything will change. Don't get me wrong. Right? Kind of like Eisenhower said, you know, before the battle, planning is everything after the battle starts, planning means nothing. But it's everything before the battle. So at the beginning of the day, what you need to make sure that your team is doing, and by the way, can I say this? Uh, this time around, Jesse's leading all of the mission teams. There's a reason for that, because they're looking for emerging leaders to come out. Right? How Paul trained his mission team leaders was on mission. Hey, Timothy, Titus, come with me. They weren't ready. He took them and trained them on the job. And by the way, 
because we're Americans, got to be saved. The leader does not emerge by being John Wayne. Listen up, pilgrim, you know, the can-do attitude, the fake it till you make it. I got this, you know. That's not, good luck with that on a mission team. Everything goes out the window. Nothing goes according to plan. You're out of your depth. The way that Jesus said in a group of 12 guys, you become the servant. That's how you know your leader. He's a guy that will lay his life down, like Paul said about Timothy. For I have no one like him who will genuinely care for your needs. Right? He would say things like, receive him as you would receive me. Right? That's the guy. The guy that's consumed with the glory of Christ and the interests of others. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbors yourself. That's the guy who's going to be the leader. Amen? So what you need to do is at the beginning of that day, the plan is laid out clearly. This is what we're doing. This is the agenda. This is where we're going to eat. Everybody's on the same team. So when all goes haywire, no one panics. Everyone's like, okay. And pray regularly. Don't just communicate with each other. Communicate with God. You're on mission, right? Who's on mission with you? God, right? Do you got to figure everything out? No. Do you need God to turn up supernaturally and get you out of a bunch of jams and open up doors of opportunity? Yes. And he will do that. Make sure that you are regularly praying. I know all of this sounds kind of cliche, but there's a reason why Acts chapter 1 comes before Acts chapter 2. Because before Pentecost, before the great mission, before the great evangelistic experience they had, before it all kicked off, that's why they're praying. You need to be praying. I would personally say to you, take communion every day, whether it's in the morning, whether it's in the evening, or whether it's both. Get Jesus right back in the center, wait on him, meditate on him, and at the end of every day, debrief about how it went. You'll be tired, you'll be worn out, but you need to do it. Do it right after dinner, every night that you're on mission, and debrief. And that keeps the community. People can talk about the frustrations. Yeah, it was really frustrating today when we did this. And it doesn't just build up, right? Um, people don't end up uh, carrying things for a couple days. You, you have a chance to actually, hey, you know what? Today I found this hard. Don't be a jerk about it, right? Like, you know, when Bob over there, you know, decided that he was going to pass out the sack lunches, I was deeply offended because I'm really good at that. And everyone else knows it. They told me. You know, um, be cool about it. You know, what I found hard today was this and that, and don't attack people. Don't ever attack people. You know, there's a, a, an old saying that, that Christians fight each other when they're not busy fighting the devil, right? You're not fighting the good fight. You're fighting a bad fight somewhere. Too busy when you're fighting the good fight to be fighting each other, right? And one thing in church planning that we always do, church plants are kind of weird, um, church plants always, uh, people see, it's kind of creepy. People see this little church plant and they're like, aha, there's a place for me to thrust my agenda on. It's a little small. The big church won't put up with me, but I can really thrust, you know, there's only a few people and they're probably easy to manipulate and I can get in there with my agenda at the ground floor, at the ground level, and I can really push my thing on them. I've learned over the years at the very beginning of a church plant, you just, you just don't let anyone hijack it. You. you just say, you know what guys, it's about two things here. It's about Jesus and it's about the lost. If you ain't about that, you need to take a hike because you ain't wired for church planting, right? You're, you're, there are churches that are into what you're into. I'm into emotional healing. That's all I'm about. Or I'm into Israel, and all I do is talk and think about Israel. Okay, there are churches like that or end times prophecy that are all into that just like you. You need to go there because we're going to have a work of the Spirit happening here, and you're going to jack it up. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? It's a little bit hard nose, but you got to protect your mission team. You guys have to protect. If God is going on mission, God's not taking you to Haiti. He's not taking you to the Philippines so you can like go and talk about Israel and Bible prophecy. As much as you may love it, God is taking you over there to talk about Jesus, the gospel, his grace, his power. All that, that It's Jesus. That's it. That makes sense? Jesus and the lost. That was Paul's in for I labor to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. So your team has to be focused on that. And then lastly, conflict. This is my last point. Um, they told me I could go till 8.30. I'm like, I'll be done in an hour. So um, here we go. Last point. Conflict. Um, obviously, you can understand by now if you were on a mission team with me, that would never happen. You would all love me naturally. And uh, you would, you know, never think of having conflict with me. Um, 
conflict is natural. Frustration is natural. One of the things that you need to learn is to be real. That's why I started off in the beginning. You know, you know what happens on mission teams when people don't actually understand the grace of God? Grace, by the way, for any church planning team or any mission or anything, has to, if you don't understand the grace of God, you need to go and read books on the grace of God. You need to go read books because the only way you're going to be able to be a purveyor of grace, of God's grace, is if you yourself are filled with God's grace. You have to understand the grace, right? Gospel-centered life is, uh, I would start there personally. Read gospel-centered life, uh, that doesn't straighten you out, you ain't saved, right? You need to get saved. Read it again second time, you'll probably be saved by the end of that. It's all about God's grace. You need that, okay? Because what God's grace does, it allows you to be real. And why that's important is when you're on mission, you're going to be jet-lagged. Some of you guys are going to be on a 26-hour flight. I don't care how sanctified I am, how holy I think I am, you see me on the other end of a 26-hour flight, and it ain't going to be pretty. There's a reason why Jesse said, we're going to debrief for a couple days. Because we're not going to be any good to ourselves. Have you ever been so tired where you're stumbling around, and you're trying to make coffee, and you're pouring like flour in the coffee maker, and you're like, ah, that's how you're going to be. Just know that, okay? You're going to be a complete and utter wreck who needs God's grace all over, scooping you up, filling you, surrounding you. You need God's grace. And so you're going to need to have God's grace with everyone else. And there's going to be days, remember, like I said, where I'm holding it together and we're marching to the other side of the town because nothing's going according to plan. He's got to learn to relax. Hopefully your mission team will learn to laugh. I look at the Gospels and I see Jesus' mission team um, and I see humor all the way throughout with those guys, you know. Thomas called Didymus the twin. Hey, you look like Jesus. Here's twin. Here's twin. You know, they're picking on each other. Thaddeus, you know what Thaddeus means? Milk baby, child of the breast. Isn't that an awesome name to call your friend? Hey, milk baby. There ah, comes a the milk baby. John and James, Lord, those people will not listen. We must call fire down upon them. And Jesus just goes, from now on, you're Bonergies, right? You can just see, you don't get, I used to be a firefighter when I was in Wales for four years, right? It was one of my little tent making jobs. I'm telling you, I served with 20 guys in a station house. There's no way you're getting 12 guys together and not going to rip on each other and laugh and cut up the whole time. That's what men do. The military, it doesn't matter, pseudo-military, it doesn't matter where you put men, you put a bunch of men together and it's no holds barred, right? So these 12 guys are traveling around. I guarantee you there was laughter. And what I see Jesus doing with that is he's easing tension. These guys are all upset and he gives them a funny name, Sons of Thunder, right? And call the, you know, and everyone has a laugh. Your team has to be able to laugh at itself. In order to be able to laugh at yourself, you got to not take yourself so dang seriously. But you got to learn to take God seriously. Take him seriously. Don't take yourself so seriously. That's what grace does. Grace allows you that freedom to go, you know, hey, man, <laughs> I really don't want to go out and share the gospel today. I'm pretty jacked up. How about you? And everyone's like, yeah, me too. Let's go seek the Lord, man. Whew, good. Because I really didn't want to fake it for the next 24 hours. You know what I'm saying? That was going to be really hard. I didn't think I could take anymore. Because you're at your limit on the mission field. You are at your limit. And you need to be able to be real. You need to be able to come boldly before the throne of grace and be able to receive mercy and help in your time of need. Does that make sense? So you just got to look at each other. Grace, grace. You got to come together, take communion, remember God's grace, let it wash all over you every morning, every night. That's why I'm suggesting communion once a day, twice a day. Your team will have to decide. Get back before the cross every day. Every day. Don't let the cross get out of your sight, out of your mind. Your team needs that. And when there's conflict... And there will be conflict because you're not at your best, right? You ever notice how, like, have you ever done this? Like, you know, you're, you're, like, bickering with your wife about something completely stupid, and you know it's just stupid, and you're both tired, and it doesn't really matter. Have you ever done that? Because you're like, no. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, that's why. That's why. Who, who said that? All right, good man. She's like, uh-huh. But... <laughs> You know it's because you're tired. So you're going to be on this mission team and you, there will be conflict. Even Paul and Barnabas, right? The famous story about Paul and Barnabas and all the theologians and commentators. Oh, well, this would happen. This would happen. Well, no, I think this would happen. All I know is the two guys spend enough time together to know what they're doing. They split off. The gospel went two separate directions. Hey, praise the Lord. 
That probably needed to happen. That started a chain reaction where Paul started grabbing more guys like Silas, and then he started discipling because he's thinking, hey, two is better than one. They worked it out in the end anyways. You're going to have conflict. Don't worry about it. Doesn't mean your team has failed. Doesn't mean God's not with you. God was obviously with Barnabas. He was obviously with Paul. Okay? God used it. So when conflict comes, here's what I've learned. A, don't take it so seriously. If you're having debrief, communicating anyways, it's going to be less likely to happen. If you need to have it out with somebody, do it in private. Don't ever do it in front of the group. I would also suggest if you've got something that, that is irritating you right then, you make a commitment later, later, later. Hold it in for then. Wait till later and say to the person, hey, I need to talk to you a little bit later if we can, okay? And pick an opportune time where everything's not all crazy and talk to them about it later, okay? Conflict is, uh, it's hard. And understand this. I, I told you I serve with a multidisciplinary team, so I've got guys that are more evangelistic, guys that are more teachers. And one thing you learn is if God divided leaders up, and like for me, I, I remember I was with my church once, and I'm like, look, guys, this is what we need to do. Because we start in a Starbucks. I said to him, look, there's a trucker stop on the other side of the motorway. We need to go take that trucker stop for Jesus, right? We need to go over there on a Sunday morning, and we need to reach truckers and prostitutes and, you know, just go in there. Oh, and, you know, that's what we're here for, right, guys? Hardcore, hardcore. And this one woman just goes, Peyton, what about the kids? I'm like, oh, there's a Burger King there, and there's a play gym. Wow, it must be the Lord, right? And they're like, no. <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not doing church in a truck stop and putting our kids in the, in the ball pit at the Burger King. <laughs> and, and I've learned over the years that I need leaders who think differently than me. I need people around me who see what I don't see because I'm more church planning. I'm, everything's about church planning, expanding the kingdom of God outward. I am not a shepherd. I'm not a shepherd. I'm a church planner. So the shepherd, when you have all these problems and the shepherd, Mike Bonomo back there, that dude's a shepherd, man. He'll sit down. Charlie, that dude's a teacher, man. He'll teach you. He'll take you as deep as you want to go in the word, right? He'll pull out big books and go, check this book out, read that. Check this book out, read that right? And you'd be like, whoa, I didn't know there was so much. And Charlie's like, yes, I've done my job. Mike Bonomo, when he sits down, he counts you through your addictions and all your demons. I didn't know that happened in my childhood. I didn't know that affected me so much. <laughs> oh, Lord, take that area of my life. Beam. And Mike's like, yes, I did my job. And for me, I feel like I did my job when you guys are like, oh, man, let's get out there and conquer the world for Jesus. And we all need each other. Because if just teachers run the church, what happens is we become a classroom, Right? If um, uh, evangelists just run the church, then we become a harvest crusade all year round. We need shepherds. If, if it's a shepherd just all the time, it's like focus on the family. And people are like, dude, is that all we talk about? It's like family and your kids and boom, boom, boom. Like if you got guys working together, and that's, that's what we do in church plants. We got all these different guys with these different flavors then the saints get equipped. So on your mission team, understand, just because somebody has, hey, I think we ought to, doesn't mean they're wrong. It means that they might be seeing something you don't see. And you know where I've learned? You, you think about it. I serve with a team of guys, and we're all together, right? I don't have to be the big boss man. We all serve together. They'll tell you we serve on a team. We come together regularly. We talk. We pray about it. Um, and if we have an impasse, we don't vote. What we do is we go, Jesus, you're the senior pastor. You're the guy on mission in this community. You're the one leading this, including me, including you, including you. And as leaders, Lord, we're all wired to see. We believe that biblically. We are all wired to see different aspects of the mission that you've put us on. Therefore, Lord, what are you trying to say to us as a leadership team? And we get on our faces and we pray. And when Charlie and I were just serving the two, Charlie and I had a lover spat once, right? Our little bromance. It was like, not really. But we, I remember we got into it, and it was like the teacher coming, you know, and the uh, apostolic guy. And then most times, and, and including that time, almost always we'd be like, it's not this way. It's not that way. 
There's a third way. It's what Jesus is saying through both of us. And if we got on our faces and we humbled ourselves, we'd hear what the Lord is saying through both of us. I believe God wants to lead in team. Church Zero, shameless plug. Get it at the back for $15.99. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Cha-ching! That's all I got to say tonight. I hope that has helped you tonight. Um, I will take a couple of uh, questions before. Uh, we're going to play a little video um, for you. It's about church planning because obviously I am a missionary. And uh, we got a video. We're going to try it out on you tonight. We've never shown it before. You are the first audience to ever see this. It's about Newbreed Church Plan. I asked permission to show this. But uh, before that, are there any questions um, that you have from anything I've said? Um, yeah. 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 Rely on the Holy Spirit. You know, Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest soul warriors that ever lived, um, he would see people save like crazy. And it was said that every time he walked up to the, to the pulpit, he'd say, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe. And he would say it over and over and over because he needed it. And so when you're on mission, just keep thinking, Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, I need the Holy Spirit. You will receive power. Guys, sometimes it's when you're out there doing it. You step out in faith, and the Holy Spirit comes then. That's when I experience it. I don't wait. You know, the Holy Spirit's already been given to the church. I go out. I step out now since the Holy Spirit's been given. I step out, and I feel like He meets me after I take that step of faith. We've done everything in Long Beach from open air in the park. Like I said, we told you uh, about some of the people. We've got transgender prostitutes. That makes people mad. Um, when they come to church, uh, Christians only, and we're like, okay, well, they're, they're not going to be with us. That's cool. No, I'm not a shepherd. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus and the lost. I don't care about them. There's other churches. Well, this person's the last stop for hell. So we're here for them, right? That's how I think about it. Um, uh, I need shepherds to pull me back, but, uh, you know, but I need, they need me too. Does that make sense? Because they'd be like, let's just, you know, get everyone together and work out their problems, you know? And, and I'm like, no, we got to go out there because there's more people with problems. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So, uh, but yeah, it's reliance on the Holy Spirit. Any, any other questions? Yeah. The, uh, the patience thing has been really a, a word that's been kind of pumped into my, my life lately. And because uh, I'm like, I want to go, I want to go. But uh, now, like, when I sign up for Haiti, you know, that's September. Like, is that, how do I know I'm not rushing something? Like, I just, you know, as you're saying that, like, Okay, I signed up for Haiti because I want to take steps of faith, but then, like, am I just going to, like, I mean, unless I get full confirmation not to go, do I just go for it? If you have a desire to go there because of the need, and Jesus has told you to go out into the world, I always tell people, I think every single Christian ought to go on a short-term mission. Now, I'm going to shock you here, but I think the Mormons got it right. Not, not on their theology mind, okay? Please bear with me. Um, but, but on their missiology. I, I personally think the fact that they send Christians, young I mean, excuse me, the fact that they send young men and women out, um, yeah, that they send young men and women out one to two years and just say to them, we don't know what you can do the rest of your life. Like, I actually think they're outdoing us. I remember Walter Martin used to say, are you doing for the truth what the cults are doing for a lie? Um, I don't understand why we don't promote, go for a year, have a gap year, right? Um, we'll do it for like a second. Oh, go live in Europe. It's awesome. It's amazing. Why not tell people to go do a gap year in the Philippines? Why not tell them? I'm telling you, they'll come back different. If every Christian went to the mission field for a year or two, come, I'm just telling you, you come back different. He's already told you to go. I just go. And if he tells you not to go, um, I, I love what Keith Green said. He said, Jesus commands us to go. It should be the exception when we stay. Um, my wife, by the way, uh, knew Keith. My uh, brother-in-law was um, Keith Green's best friend, Todd Fishkin. So my wife grew up, before I married my wife, she was in Thailand rescuing kids out of prostitution. She's more hardcore than I am, right? She, uh, all, her, like, all of her brothers and sisters She's the youngest of seven. All of them went to the mission field or were involved in missions. Some of them were stayers and still are and still support missionaries. Um, it, it wrecked them. It, it, the, the whole Jesus movement changed them. Keith Green's influence, that whole mission thing changed them. That whole, 
you know, everybody's called. Everyone should go. So you're here, you're involved. Everybody ought to be involved in mission. You know what I'm saying? Everybody. So if that makes sense. So I think you should go. And uh, if God stops you, then, then you don't, you know. I think everyone ought to go. Yeah. How, how different do you think everyone would be? By the way, when young people go to somewhere like Haiti and they see Christianity, the Christianity makes sense in Haiti. You know what I'm saying? When they see people out there helping people, they get it. They're like, I understand now the love of God, the love of Christ, how he loves these, these people need saving. They Boom, boom, boom. They just get it. You know? Young people. I, I, a 30-hour famine. They're doing that right here. I remember watching kids that weren't saved get saved during 30-hour famine because they saw Christianity in action. People don't understand Christianity in theory. They don't understand it in concept. Um, they understand it in action. Young people, that's what connects with them. So, same with men, too. Men are bored at church, man. Men like to do stuff, you know? Men, men aren't good at just sitting. Men are like, I want to fix stuff. So, you put men on mission. They're like, woo, you know, they take off. So, sorry, I'm not going to teach again. That wasn't really teaching. That was kind of me. I told you, I just, if you get me preaching, I'll expose it, but that was just kind of talking tonight. So, sorry if it was boring at points, but, uh, but I'm not a good talker, so. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, let's pray. Can we pray? All right. Lord, we just uh, thank you, Father, for um, the fact that you are on mission. I thank you that you're going before these teams, that you're going to be there already. And Lord, that uh, the command to us is not necessarily to wait, but we do give ourselves pause to think, Lord, are we just going to rush out there and, Lord, not depend upon you? I thank you that we have that model. Lord, of these guys that had to have something extra given to them. And Lord, we already have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So Lord, when we step out in faith, we're asking you, Lord, to empower us. You're already in us, Lord. And because you're in us, Lord, when we share the gospel, the reason we come away with such a buzz is because your spirit is in us. And he's doing exactly what he indwelt us for. And we feel that partnership with you. We feel that buzz, Lord, that joy that this is what I'm here for. Because, Lord, otherwise you would have yanked us up to heaven. But you left us here to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And then, as Jesus said, and when the gospel is gone to the ends of the earth, then the end will come. Father, we're not done yet. And so I just pray that these guys, Lord, might even spark a chain reaction. I pray as they read the book of Acts, as they read these missionary biographies, Lord, that you would spark something in them that says, why not me? Why not me, Lord? Here am I. Lord, send me. And we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen.